everyone. Well, it's that time of the year, time to go back to school. Some of you have already started and some of you are about to start. So today I'm going to read you a story called School for Bears. Grizzly bears are known for being large and very ferocious. They can be up to seven feet tall and weigh over 500 pounds. But when grizzly bear cubs are born, they're very small and helpless. A newborn cub is blind and has no teeth and no fur. It is only eight inches long and weighs just over a pound. It is about the size of a big banana. Cubs grow fast. By the time the grizzly cub is a few months old, its mother is already teaching it many things. She shows her cubs how to find berries, roots, and nuts. She also teaches the cubs how to catch a fish. Grizzlies like to stand behind a stream and scoop salmon out of the water with their big paws. The little cub must practice many times before they can catch their first fish. The mother teaches them to hunt, fish, and protect themselves from danger. They learn new things every day. Just like bear cubs, people need to learn many things too. Our parents and teachers help us to learn to read, to ride a bike, to tie our shoes, to dance, to play musical instruments, and to understand about God and the Bible. Learning is fun and exciting and helps everyone grow. I hope everyone has a wonderful school year and have a great Sunday and a great week. Bye. In just a moment, we are going to do our blessing of the backpacks. But before we do that, for those of you who are just now joining us, I uh, want to remind you that today is Communion Sunday. So if you're here in the building, you want to grab one of these individual communion kits from the Narthex. And if you're watching us online, you want to run to your kitchen at any point in the next few minutes and grab something like bread, something like juice that you can use as we celebrate and enjoy communion later on in the service. So today is Back to School Sunday, and our tradition on this Sunday is that we have all of our students bring their backpacks, their lunch bags, their lunch boxes, whatever it is that they use as the implements of their learning, and same with our teachers. And we usually gather them right here up at the chancel table, and we say a prayer of blessing for those things. Uh, we are not doing that today for obvious reasons, for safety reasons, but we did invite everyone to bring something like that with you. And so I'm going to grab mine right over here real quick. This is the bag that I use to carry all of my implements of learning. And I'm, I'm actually beginning school this year for the first time in a long time as I start a PhD program uh, at the University of Aberdeen. So I get to be a student this year uh, as well and for the next six years. Uh, but everyone who is uh, starting this school year, and it is a challenging school year, we certainly want to say a prayer for you. So grab your backpack if you've got it, wherever you are watching us from. Uh, hold on to that, and we are going to say a special prayer for those bags and also for you this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we start a new school year for teachers, for students, for administrators, for anyone in a learning community, we know that this is a challenging time to do that. Some of our students and teachers are already begun. Uh, they're teaching from home or learning from home. Some are about ready to go back in person to their schools. Some have already done so. But wherever we are at, Lord, we ask that you watch over us. Watch over our students, our teachers, and our school personnel. Keep them safe this year above all else. But Lord, also in the midst of that, open our hearts and open our minds and help us to seek your wisdom. Help for this to be a, just a wonderful, amazing school year that despite its rocky start, will be something beneficial, something meaningful to all who finish that race at the end of the year. 
Lord, for all of these things, we give you thanks. We ask your blessing upon these backpacks that are being held by our students and teachers right now. We ask your blessing not just on the backpacks and book bags, but on those who carry them. Bless them in all things. Show them your favor and help them to learn what they need to learn this year. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. And all of God's people said, amen. Our scripture reading this morning, actually no, before the scripture reading, I'm supposed to do some announcements about things that are going on in the life of our community. I don't have a ton of announcements for once, uh, but I do have just a few. We have come to the end of our sermon series on the Psalms last week. Today I'm going to preach a little bit on uh, young Jesus going back to school. But then starting next week, we have our sermon series on the parables of Jesus, which I'm calling Jesus and his pair of bulls. Should be a picture, right? There we go. I made that picture. Pretty proud of it. Not the Jesus part, but the bulls part. All right, so Jesus and his pair of bulls, hopefully a fresh take on the parables of Jesus. And then I want to continue to thank and encourage all of you who have been supporting the church financially with your giving, with your donations, and remind you of the ways in which we do that. You can give to the church online through our website at firstpresbyterian.church. If you have a smartphone, you can also make contributions through the Venmo smartphone app. And, of course, if you prefer, you can always write a check or donate using cash uh, by dropping it off here at our church office or by mailing a check to 1340 Murchison Street. However you choose to give, we are thankful for the gifts. It is what enables us to keep doing what we do in ministry here. And then finally, I wanted to recognize some folks who are enjoying birthdays this week or the past week, including Melissa Lawal, Amy Locke, Rose Adams, Owen Bustios, and Deanna Schweitzer. If you see any of those people, please make sure to wish them a happy birthday and let them know just how much we appreciate having them as part of our faith community. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. As I said, after a long season of the Psalms from the Old Testament, we are back in the Gospels back in the New Testament. So Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. If you brought a Bible or if you have a smartphone and can look up the passage, I encourage you to do so and follow along with us. Luke 2, 41 through 52. Now every year his parents, that's the parents of Jesus, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. Let us pray. Lord, may these, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As I've said before, today is back to school Sunday. 
So I'm reminded of the story about a young high school student who was failing in all of his math classes. His parents were desperate to help him, and so they took him out of the school he was in and enrolled him instead at the local Catholic school. And after just a few weeks, the boy brought home a progress report showing straight A's on every math assignment. And his parents were tremendously pleased, but they wanted to know, how are your math grades suddenly so good? Well, the son explained to them, you know, when I walked into the classroom on that first day and I saw that guy on the wall nailed to a plus sign, I knew this place meant business. In today's scripture passage, a young 12-year-old Jesus goes back to school, though not exactly in the way his parents expected. As the father of three children of my own, all of whom think that this church building is their personal property, I can identify with at least one aspect of this story, losing them. I believe I've lost at least one in the last five minutes of my children. And I find myself saying the words, has anyone seen my children? About as often as I say the words, let us pray. Or in the original Hebrew text, so there's absolutely no judgment on my part toward Mary and Joseph who spend three entire days looking for their lost son before they finally find him in the temple studying the scriptures. By the way, Grady, Abby, and Jonah, if you are listening, that's exactly what you should be doing when I eventually find you, studying the scriptures. To be fair to Jesus' parents, they were most likely traveling to and from Jerusalem with a very large caravan of family and friends and extended relatives. You can almost imagine that conversation between Mary and Joseph. Hey, have you seen Jesus? I thought he was with you. No, I left him with your brother Jesse. But I just saw him two minutes ago with Grandma Anne. No, that's actually his cousin Hannah. They have the same hairstyle. I told you he needed a haircut. I've heard a lot of sermons on this text. And it's common for the preachers to focus on the humanity of Jesus' parents. And that's because we can identify with their worry, their distress, their chastising of their teenage strong-willed son. But then this humanity is usually contrasted with the divinity of young Jesus, who seems detached, wise beyond his years and beyond his elders, truly the Son of God, perfect in every way, even at the age of 12, and thus not like you or me or like any of our children. But I disagree with that take on the story. In fact, I don't think there's anything particularly extraordinary about young Jesus in this story. And in fact, he reminds me of countless teenagers that I have known and taught over the past two decades. And all of them, at some point, could be described as amazing or astonishing when they come into their element, when they find their place in the world. What is extraordinary, however, about this story is how everything and everyone in the story works together in a near-perfect educational ecosystem that leads to a powerful result. That result is in verse 52. Jesus, the student, increased in wisdom and in years, in divine and in human favor. Now that word translated as favor is the Greek word kariti, which is where we get the English word charity. It means love and kindness towards others. I think that's the goal that most of us have for our own children and for the children in our community, that with each passing year, they might grow in wisdom, in their love for God and the world around them, and in their kindness toward their fellow human beings. 
fact, that should be the goal of every school, every family, and every community of education. So as we begin another school year, and a challenging one at that, what can we learn from this story? There are so many things, but I want to focus on five, five things. And the first is this. Education begins in the rituals and traditions of the family. We read in verses 41 and 42 that every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. You see, if not for this tradition faithfully and consistently observed, the events of the story, the education of Jesus could not have taken place. And since we read that Jesus is 12 years old, when this happens, presumably that means it took place, the trip took place 11 times before Jesus was finally ready to grasp its significance and his place in the story. What are your family traditions? What do your children see you doing over and over again that they will learn to emulate? If you want your children to become strong readers, do they see you reading on a regular basis? If you want your children to love God, do they see you faithfully and consistently participating in the life of the church and in prayer. Whatever rituals and traditions are usual to you will become usual to them, part of the fabric of their childhood and then later on their adult lives. So education begins in the rituals and traditions of the family. Two, the family lays the foundation, but the child is in charge of building. Mary and Joseph and their community established this tradition of traveling to the temple every year for Passover, but it is young Jesus and only Jesus on his own timeline and at his own initiative who seizes that moment and makes a critical decision about where he wants to be and what he wants to learn. Now that is very different than the classic 20th century approach to education, where the parents or the teacher or the state even are the ones in charge of when, where, and how education happens and what that education looks like. And the student, the child, is merely a passive recipient of knowledge. Now, I'm not saying don't send your kids to school until they show an interest at the age of 12. Mary and Joseph create the opportunity. They create the environment for Jesus to learn from the very beginning of his life with those rituals and traditions. But Jesus is the one who ultimately takes the initiative. And I believe that the best educational approaches are the ones that respect the dignity and the agency of our children, not empty vessels waiting to be filled up, but active explorers, researchers, fully in charge of their own interests, their own inclinations, and their own education. We can encourage them. We can set the stage and prepare the way for them. But when they finally take off running, our job as parents, educators, as leaders in the community, our job, just like Mary and Joseph did, is to run and catch up with them as best as we can, to find them where they are and where they have chosen to be. And then, verse 48, to be astonished and amazed. So the family lays the foundation, but the student is in charge of the building. Number three, education is a conversation. Verses 46 and 47, after three days they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them 
and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. How many of you, when you were young children, were familiar with the old saying, children are to be seen and not heard? Or how many of you as children were taught in your schools and in your churches, maybe in your home, not to question the teacher, not to question the pastor or the parents? I have news for you. That's not education. That's programming. As a parent and as a teacher, yes, I have been guilty myself of becoming supremely annoyed with 500 repetitions of the question, but why? 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 And yet, as an educator, I also know that this simple question, why, is the foundation and the heart of every scientific, philosophical, and theological advancement in the history of humanity. Why? And so when our children ask us this question, it means they are ready to listen to us. They are willing to learn, and they are eager to understand. And so we should embrace that question as often as it comes. Notice, too, that when Joseph and Mary finally find Jesus in the temple, they ask him a question. And he responds immediately by asking them two questions, starting with why. And then in verse 50, we read, but they did not understand. And that's important because I think it's okay if sometimes the only answer you have to give your child, your student, to that question why is, I don't know, but let's find out together. Education is a conversation. Four, education is a stretchy, lifelong community enterprise. Let me say that again. That's a lot. Education is a stretchy, lifelong community enterprise. What do I mean by that? Well, first, there are a lot of people in this story. Yes, at the center is Jesus, and next to him, his parents, but we also have the entire extended family and friends and acquaintances who make that journey with Jesus and his family every year, helping to lay that foundation. We also have the teachers in the temple who listen and talk and are perhaps able to see something in young Jesus that even his own parents cannot. And we have the temple itself, a space that according to the book of Exodus was intentionally designed as a sensory and symbolic experience, a visual and tangible teacher in its own right. The very best of our sacred spaces and classrooms are just that. Here in this building, if you look at the stained glass windows, they tell a story. The very steps and the table and the cross teach something to those who may not be quite as interested in the guy talking up at front. So the environment is also a teacher. And then permeating all of this story is the Spirit of God, personified here in the Greek language as Sophia, Lady Wisdom who according to the book of Proverbs was present with God at the creation and raises her voice in the public squares to make her teachings known. Sophia, wisdom. Also, communities are elastic. They're stretchy. They bend us and they stretch us, but they don't break. Jesus, like all teenagers exploring their world and exploring themselves, Jesus pulls away from his parents, but they come back to him. He stretches the understanding of the teachers in the temple, and hopefully they stretch him a little bit too. His parents, when they finally show up, push him a little bit on his choices, his insensitivity at not telling them where he was, and he pushes them back. But ultimately, he comes back home with them, and we read that he was obedient to them. So the family leaves intact, but the temple 
pulls Jesus back and the teachers of the temple over and over again throughout his life and ministry right up to the very end of his life and ministry. Education is stretchy and it is a lifelong community enterprise. Fifth and finally, education is a valuable treasure. Near the end of our story, we read in verse 51 that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. I suspect that Joseph did too. But when education happens, even if we're not in complete control of the process, and we are never in complete control of the process, even when the timing or the outcome or the method is not what we planned, not what we envisioned, even when that education is messy or painful or incomplete, it is always something to be revered, something to be pursued, and something to be treasured. Proverbs 4 teaches that above all else, we should seek wisdom. Do not forsake her. Again, this is wisdom personified as Sophia. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. She will place on your head a fair garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. And what is a crown if not a treasure? Education is a treasure, and it's a treasure that once given, once received, can never, ever be taken away from you. Education is a valuable treasure. So students and teachers of the 20. 20, 2021 school year, and I believe we are all students, that we are all teachers. May this be your goal and your constant aim, to seek wisdom. And just like Jesus and the community that formed him, may you also grow in stature, in wisdom, in favor with God, and in favor with all humankind.